Can you hear me now? <laughs> Thank you. Hi, guys. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've missed the best part. <laughs> Honored guests, this evening I have a singular honor of presenting to you one of our newest additions to the illustrious community of scholars who hold the title of full professor of Rhodes University, Julie Kutsi. Julie grew up in the east of Johannesburg and went to Ramrad Park Primary, where her mother, as I've indicated, is with us this evening, was a teacher. There, of course, is a bit of cheating there. Her mom instilled a love of learning and reading, and Julie would often be found up a tree, reading a book, hiding away from her younger sister, who is also here with us. Her interest in the natural world was sparked on holidays to her grandparents' farm in the Mojaches Cliff and her other grandparents' house on the KZN South Coast. Every plant, every little hocha and bird never escaped her attention and interest. At Centrum High School, Julie's love for biology grew. And she was known as the biology teacher to her friends, often the night before exams. Sounds familiar? Julia and her childhood friend Graham enrolled at Vets University together to study zoology and botany with the aim of becoming nature con conservationists. She says that Graham played a huge role in influencing her in her love for the outdoors, and particularly bed bedding, beds, bedding. Her biocontrol journey was sparked in second year university study by her professor, Marcus Byrne, who later together with distinguished professor Martin Hill, who is here with us this evening, supervised her PhD on water hyacinth bio biocontrol, which is her passion to this day. 
Julie Radford had a BSc degree between 1995 and 1997 at the University of the Witwatersrand and graduated with a distinction. In 1998, she enrolled for her BSc honors in zoology at WITS, again, graduating with a distinction. And between 2001 and 2003, she pursued her master's degree in entomology, which was upgraded to a PhD and completed in 2004. Her PhD focused on the biological control on the, of, of the pervasive water hyacinth. In 2014, Julie completed an assessor's course, which is offered at Rhodes University. And she completed that with the highest mark. Between December 2003 and January 2006, Professor Kutsier ran field projects, tutorials, and developing conservation courses for the Organization for Tropical Studies Undergraduate Semester Abroad Program, while lecturing at the School of Animal, Plant, and Environmental Sciences at the University of Witwatersrand. She was a resident professor and a faculty member of the Organization for Tropical Studies offering courses that were accredited by the University of Cape Town, WITS, and Duke University in the USA. At the start of 2006, Professor Kutze got an opportunity to return to full-time aquatic with bio biological control research at the WITS division of the Plant Protection Research Institute at the Agricultural Research Council. Julie joined Rhodes University in April 2007 as a senior research officer in the Department of Zoology and Entomology. Her work was focused on aquatic weed biocontrol. In 2015, she was promoted to the rank of associate professor in the Department of Botany. And in 2022, she was promoted to the rank of full professor of Rhodes University. Since May 2018, Professor Kutsia has been the deputy director of the Center for Biological Control, a highly productive research group that is producing groundbreaking research. In the years that she has been at Rhodes University, she has supervised and co-supervised 14 PhD and 30 master's graduates. In 2009 and 2010, Professor Kutsia was awarded the Tutuka Women in Research Award. And in 2010, she received an NRFY rating. In 2016, she received a CITU rating. And last year, that improved to a C1 rating. Between 2013 and 2016, Julie applied for interns through the NRF's internship program and successfully mentored six interns during the period, all from previously disadvantaged backgrounds. Her awards at our university have also been impressive. She received our environmental award in 2014 and the Rhodes University Vice Chancellor's Distinguished Research Award in 2016. But perhaps her most impressive recognition is for, is for her community engagement work for the Center for Biological Control. The university awarded her efforts with the Vice Chancellor's Distinguished Community Engagement Award in 2013. Since 2009, the Center for Biological Control has employed people with disabilities as part of its Disabled People's Program. Julie also initiated a school's mass rearing program, which is now active at seven schools across the country. The initiative teaches, uh, sorry, the initiative teaches learners 
to rear and release biological control agents and serves as an educational tool for teachers to teach plant insect interactions, ecology, and ecosystem science. Building on the school's mass rearing program success, Julie initiated community mass rearing programs for those affected by water hyacinth invasions, invasions on systems of importance to them, empowering regular people to change their environment, their environment for the better. Currently, Professor Kutse is a member of the Entomological Society of South Africa and has been since 2006. She's also a member of the International Aquatic Plant Plants Group. Widely and extensively published, Professor Kutse has written 91 refereed papers in ISI rated journals, eight book chapters, and presented at 42 international and 92 local conferences. And now, colleagues and friends, it is my great pleasure to invite Professor Kutsia to present her professorial inaugural address so we can hear all about her 25 year research career in battling aquatic weeds. Julie. Okay, thanks again, Vice Chancellor. Um, and actually, for my mom and my dad and my sister who flew in from um, Johannesburg this morning. Tommy couldn't stop them. And to Grant Martin, who's sitting here, he came all the way from Clarence in the Free State. And Grant was my first PhD student, so it's really special to have you here today. And yes, just thank you everybody for coming to listen to my musings on Megamelis, which I have the privilege. Right? <laughs> okay. But I've had the privilege of working with. Um, all in an attempt to control the world's worst aquatic weed. We could be more efficient at this by now. So that's up, Zoom's working. And yes, this is, and I've left the pointer. <laughs> I will use this. Um, so I'm gonna the echo is wrong. So I'll be talking about the um, hopper Megamela scutellaris, which is the most recent biological control agent that we've released on water hyacinth. But more how, how I've got there, how we've got to this point, and it's a 25-year journey that's been absolutely exciting, um, daunting, thrilling, and I just hope some of my enthusiasm for the work that I'm doing on water hyacinth still, which I started in 1998, um, comes through in this talk. So why is water hyacinth the world's worst aquatic weed? Well, probably because it impacts the most vulnerable communities in some of the poorest countries in the poorest areas across the world. This is Lake Victoria in Kenya. 
Lake Tana in Ethiopia. This is a, the Buraganja River in Bangladesh where these um, men have created a, a, a bridge of, of boats so that people can actually cross the river. But how, and I see that the top is caught off. Can we, can we move it, Ayanda? Oh, okay. Well, anyway, I can explain what's going on here. So how did this plant become the world's worst aquatic weed? How was it spread around the world? So in, apparently, in 1884, in December, in Louisiana, there was a Centennial Cotton Exposition. And um, it was also called the World's Fair. And then these World's, Fair, these World's Fairs became quite regular features throughout history. And at this particular fair in 1884, a supposed Japanese gardener handed out this beautiful flower to all of the attendees who came to, the world, um, to this World's Fair. And all of these attendees went home with their, with their take-home presents, the gift bag, as, as we have in modern days, and popped them into their fish ponds, popped them into their um, tropical tanks. And soon these plants became um, too overgrown and ended up in rivers. And just 14 years later, in weekly, this news article appeared say, showing how the... Um, how the St. John's River in Florida was completely overrun with water hyacinths. So this was before the 1900s. How did it get to South Africa? Not entirely sure, but obviously another keen um, botanist, uh, aquarium um, enthusiast would have brought this plant across. And the first record is from around 1910, the Vol River. This is a picture of the Vol River in 2010. A hundred years later, and we still have this pervasive plant um, invading our systems. And that's about a 10 kilometer stretch. So I'm standing on a bridge and that's a 10 kilometer stretch along the Vol River. If we look at the distribution of water hyacinth around um, South Africa, you can see it's, it's through every single province. It heads into the Northern Cape, which is down the Vol and into the Orange River. Um, that dots along those dots along the top of the Free State Province are the Vol River, and it's a really widespread, incredibly problematic plant in our water systems. So, how do we end up with invasions that look like this in South Africa? So, this is the Tongat River in KZN, when in its native range, the Pantanal in Brazil, the Amazon. Um, in um, Argentina, we get these beautiful aquatic ecosystems where water hyacinth is a part of the environment, but it certainly doesn't take over the entire environment. In an ordinary functioning aquatic ecosystem, we get processes that might um, act from the bottom, which we call bottom up, or that may act from the top, which we call top down. So bottom up processes, those that influence plant growth. So where we've got, oh, thank you. So where we've got um, plants growing, they provide the food for that ecosystem. And those plants grow according to resources that are in the sediment or in the water. And the amount of plant matter then affects the herbivores and in an aquatic ecosystem we get all kinds of herbivores all these little hoja looking things some fish that then influences what eats them which influences what eats them and that's called a bottom-up process in a top-down system we have predators that impact what happens in the opposite direction so the top predators eat the secondary predators, those predators eat the herbivores, the herbivores eat the plants and keep the plants under control. And what we're dealing with um, in most ecological situations is a combination of both of these top-down um, effects and these, uh, what am I saying, bottom-up effects and top-down pressures. And what's really important here is that the pool of primary producers is usually bigger 
than those levels above it. So the primary producers are your plants. It's the green stuff, the stuff that the herbivores eat. And each level gets smaller and smaller as we go through the ecosystem. And what's important for bottom-up processes is that it's the limiting resources that limit net primary production. And net primary production is photosynthesis, and photosynthesis is what makes plants um, grow and be green. And these kinds of limiting um, resources are things like the amount of water available, what kind of nutrients are available, how much light is available. So what's available in this bottom pool influences all the way to the top. Whereas, as I said, in the, in the top down, it's the other direction. So we get pressure from the top exerting um, in, the, in, the, in the downward direction. What's happening in South Africa, though, is that our limiting resources in our aquatic ecosystems are actually abundant resources. And so because we've got the, these resources over here aren't limited, suddenly we're getting a really big increase in primary production. And so these plants, such as water hyacinth, are taking advantage of all those nutrients, which are the resources in the system, and are exploding. And the reason why this is particularly um, problematic for South Africa is because our um, Department of Water and Sanitation, as it is now, adopted a very strange limit for nutrient tolerance in water bodies. Now, this is the world's economic, um, it's called the OECD, the Organization for Economic um, Cooperation and Development, and they judge water quality based on how much phosphorus is in the water. And phosphorus is an essential nutrient for plants. So when you buy your fertilizer, you'll look at how much nitrogen, how much phosphorus, and how much potassium is in it. And phosphorus comes from sewage. It comes from uh, water runoff out of farms, from agricultural areas. It comes from your household products. So the shampoo that you use, the washing powders that you use. And the OECD said that anything above 0 0.1 milligrams of phosphorus is, is too high. And a system that is too high is termed hypertrophic. And trophic just refers to the nutrient status of that system. So hyper being way nutrient, illegal meaning a little, not very nutrient rich. South African water quality guidelines, and these are from 1996, and they're actually being revised by Susie Vetter's partner um, with, through the Water Research um, Commission. South Africa, for some unknown reason, adopted a hypertrophic standard that was more than double what the rest of the world adopted. So suddenly we were allowed to, you know, municipalities were allowed to discharge far or double the amount of acceptable phosphorus into systems than what the rest of the world considered um, acceptable. So that was in 1996. So you can imagine that over the years, the amount of nutrients that have entered our systems has just been um, phenomenal. So those are those, those two points. And in South Africa, our poor quality is largely due to, and it's a, it's a huge issue at the moment. And if you're reading any Daily Maverick um, articles or anything, anything in the papers at the moment is that South Africa will be facing a water crisis far worse than any electricity crisis. And our poor water quality is largely due to, as I said, the inadequate treatment of sewage. There are very few wastewater treatment works that comply with water quality guidelines. The lack of waterborne sewage in informal settlements is a huge issue and leaves people leaving in absolutely dire conditions. It's difficult to address, should be possible, but again, this will be very expensive. Non-point inflow of agricultural runoff, so where you've got cattle farms, um, pig farms, chicken farms, where there's no um, settling pond for the waste that then's treated. Here, non-point um, inflow of all this waste entering the rivers and again increasing the pollution into those systems. And this is an estimate from 2016, is that fixing South Africa's water-related in infrastructure will cost the country at least 570 billion rand. 
um, over the next decade. I was at a meeting in, in um, Pretoria not so long ago where they said that to treat just two of Pretoria's plants in the next 10 years is going to cost 10 billion rand. So I think these, this estimate is, is rather um, an underestimate. And so because we've got these polluted rivers, these systems that are just receiving all our nutrient runoff, we end up with impacted water bodies. For example, Hardebeersport Dam. This is a picture from uh, 2008 when Grant Martin and I went on a, on a trip to Hardebeersport. There wasn't much water hyacinth here, but the water is a beautiful emerald green. It's an algae which takes advantage of all the phosphorus in the system. The same thing in the Crocodile River West, which flows out of Hardebeersport. Rudderplatt Dam, for any of those, uh, those of you who row, this is a scene that you would have seen. Um, this is what you would see in the, again in the sort of 20, 2010 um, period. Bright green water, toxic blue-green algae, and patches of water hyacinth growing. And this is all because our water is really bad. This is another image, and I, I often use this image because it's just so typically what we, what we get in South Africa. This is in Bazambo Swamp, which is just outside Stanga in KwaZulu-Natal. It's a beautiful, should be a beautiful wetland. Um, but first of all, in the background is Stanga. All the town's sewage ends up in the swamp. And over here is a sappy paper mill. And from there, all the effluent from the paper mill is pumped straight into the system. And water hyacinth says, thanks very much, and grows out of control. And a study that we did um, with water research funding money in um, 2005, we had a look at what is the nutrient status of the systems in South Africa where water hyacinth occurs? And we selected 15 sites around the country, and we had a look at their, um, the phosphorus in the water and the nitrogen in the water. And if you have a look on the, this bottom axis, that's nitrogen. So no nitrogen to a lot of nitrogen. And on this axis, we've got phosphorus, so no phosphorus to a lot of phosphorus. Now, you remember that the world's uh, water quality is 0 0.1. We have one site that was that fitted into that 0 0.1, and that's just down the road here in um, in Alicedale, New Year's Dam. Every other site where water hyacinth had invaded was way above that 0 0.1 threshold. In Bazambo Swamp, 3.95 milligrams of phosphorus per liter when we're looking at a world standard of 0 0.1. So water hyacinth likes nutrients a lot. And what happens when you have these very polluted systems is that water hyacinth grows really, really well. As tall as, granted, I don't know if you want to stand up, but very, very tall. This is, in, um, in fact, both of these sites are in the Western Cape. And the, the reason why these plants have become so problematic, they, they're highly, highly invasive. And we say, and I'm I've told you that they're problematic because of the, the nutrients in the, in the water bodies. But they rely, we call them backseat drivers. We all know a backseat driver. But these species rely on broad ecosystem disturbance. And in this case, the ecosystem disturbance is the poor water quality. If we had good water quality in South Africa, we wouldn't have a water hyacinth problem. In South Africa, we have slowed our water bodies down. We don't have very many natural lakes. We've slowed these lakes down, we've dammed them up, we've created bigger, large impoundments, and these impoundments have become eutrophic. This has facilitated the establishment of a broad suite of aquatic invasives. We don't just work on water hyacinth, there's, there's a whole suite of, of invasive species that we work on. They proliferate. And because of this, because they backseat driving of this disturbance, they then gain a competitive advantage over the native vegetation and completely take over. 
And I thought this was really funny. I don't know if anybody watches Keeping Up Appearances. Hyacinth Bucket or Bouquet. So if we have a look at our pristine ecosystem, it gets highly eutrophic. So suddenly the amount of uh, limiting resources become abundant. The water quality degrades. And what happens to that ecosystem? What happens to the functionality of it? And we had a look at what water hyacinths, so the, the, the scientific name, was Icornia crassipes. It's now called Pontederia crassipes, just for interest. Um, and what we had a look at, we went to a protected lake, uh, Lake Nsezi up in um, Richards Bay, up in northern KZN. And we looked at what a mat of water hyacinths did to benthic macro um, invertebrate diversity. And macro invertebrates are these little hohos. If you lift up a rock in a stream or you um, pick up some mud, you find all kinds of little things living in the, in the benthos, which is the bottom of that system. And we counted over time. We went back um, over a year and we had a look at what happens the this this community because if this community is being affected that community is being affected and so that community is being affected and what we found was that this is underwater hyacinth this is how many individuals in a certain number of families we found here you can see it was less than 2,000 of these little hohos underwater hyacinth and in the open, it went to more than 20,000 individuals. So the presence of water hyacinth is clearly having an impact on the ecology of the system and reducing the um, viability of, of that as a functioning ecosystem. And you can imagine what that does to ecosystems in other um, very famous conservation areas. This is Makati Sprait up in Kruger National Park, it leads into the Lataba River, into the Engelhart Dam. And it's a, a, one of the sites that we've been working on as well, highly eutrophic. Not sure which part of the food chain these guys fit in, but they're certainly not eating enough of the green stuff to, to take anything away. So if we have a look again now at our bottom up versus top down, clearly, South Africa has an issue with our abundant resources. And so we've got very, very strong bottom up effects driving these water hyacinth invasions. So as to control this without using herbicides, without, without pulling these plants out, we aim to increase the top down pressure. And how do we do that? By increasing the top down pressure from the things that eat the green stuff. And ultimately, in, in biological control, we want to get a really huge herbivore top-down pressure to then reduce our primary producers, even though we have all these abundant resources in our systems. So the way that we do that is by introducing biological control agents. Invasive species are invasive by nature because they come from somewhere else they arrive in a new um, ecosystem and they can take over. And so what we do then is we go back to where that invasive species um, originated. We find the herbivores that feed on them. We make sure that they are completely host specific, which means that they can only feed on the, the weed that we're looking at. We test it for um, a number of years. Once we are satisfied that they're damaging, that they won't eat anything else. They're not going to eat your cabbages or banana plants or roses. We apply to government for um, permission to release them. And then once that whole process is followed, we're allowed to release the insect. And that's biological control. And water hyacinth has actually had quite a long history of biological control in South Africa, starting with the release of this little weevil in 1974, it then had a bit of a hiatus and then an upsurge again in 1989, as well as the release of another weevil in 1990. And these come from South America. They come from the Amazon basin where water hyacinth originates. 
We introduced a little mite, some fungi, a moth, two species of bug called the Critotarsus, and that's what I did my, my PhD on, and a grasshopper. And all of these insects eat various parts of the water hyacinth plant. So some eat the leaves, some suck the sap, some tunnel down the middle, some eat the crown, and all of them inflict some kind of damage onto this plant. And this is a picture of very impacted plants. They've clearly been fed upon by these control agents. But if we have a look at them in the system, you can see that these plants are all quite brown. They've got quite a bit of feeding on them. If we went and had a look, we'd find a lot of insects there. But they're not exerting the top-down pressure that we want because the bottom-up resources are too abundant. And we had a look at how eutrophication of our water bodies affects the biological control of water hyacinth in South Africa. And we had a look across all the different agents and we synthesized this information. And this is a very brief summary of, of what we looked at. So we looked at nitrogen concentration and phosphorus, that should say concentration. In fact, this comes straight out of the paper. So it's a mistake in the paper. Um, <laughs> nitrogen concentration, phosphorus concentration, and these top two graphs had a look at daughter plant production. So um, vegetative reproduction, how the plant was actually increasing in number. And as nitrogen increases, daughter plant production increases. The top line is without biocontrol agents. The bottom line is with biocontrol agents. Not much difference there. Similarly for phosphorus. You increase the phosphorus, you increase the plant production. Here we're looking at biomass, similar patterns, and the bottom line is that eutrophication limits the success of biological control in a South African context. In other, other studies, so we tried to look at studies from around the world, and their nitrogen concentrations, their high concentrations, were 10 milligrams, whereas we were looking at things all the way up to 60 milligrams. So we really do have a water pollution problem. On top of this, what's also limiting biological control in South Africa is that these insects that we're introducing from nice, warm, tropical areas, the Amazon, they're low altitude, they're warm. A lot of our worst water hyacinth infestations are on the high felt in these high altitude um, systems that get really, really cold in winter. Good luck, Joe Burgers. And we expect these insects that have evolved under these very warm tropical conditions to do well in these very cold conditions where we've introduced them. This is a site in Johannesburg. This is where I did um, quite a lot of my PhD work. This is Delta Park. Um, it's a bird sanctuary. I'm not sure what birds enjoy that. There are a couple of Egyptian geese. Um, this is what it looks like in springtime. Getting towards autumn, the plants start to brown. And in winter, the frost kicks in and that entire top layer of leaves and plants is completely brown and it looks dead. Come springtime, and the plants regenerate from the crown and we start the cycle all over again. Insects have been released at the site. They establish, they do what they have to do and come winter, they die, their food dies, springtime comes and the insects um, can't, can't catch up. And so we had a look at the thermal physiology of a lot of these insects. Um, this is work a lot of the authors are in the in the audience here. Um, we looked at can we increase the the thermal limits? Can we cool them? Down? Can we rear them under cold conditions to make them more um, with, to make them better able to withstand cold conditions? And what was really nice was that um, I was invited to write this review, a global review on how we can improve using tropical insects in more temperate regions based on a lot of this water hyacinth work. So we know we've got nutrients that are a problem. We know that we've got cold winter temperatures that are a problem. So how do we address water hyacinth? 
And one of the courses of action that, that was um, suggested is that we release more agents. And so, where did that go? There. Um, and so in 2013, we released this little hopper, Mega Melis, knowing that it was gonna have to face the exact same conditions that all the other insects faced. And why would this insect do better than the others? We looked at its thermal physiology, and this is a work that a, work that a PhD student of mine did. Here's the high felt, and what she looked at was how many generations this little megamelis can complete in one year. So obviously, the greater the number of generations in a year, the faster your populations are going to build up, the more control you're going to get. And we often look at annual generations, but what's really important is what's happening during the winter. And so we had a look at winter. And if we look at this site, um, which is hard to be a sport, the insect can't, can't complete even one generation over winter. The same over here, the same over here. So in this Gauteng high altitude, cold areas, we're expecting an, an insect to do something when it can't even complete one generation over winter. But that didn't stop us. And we decided to do the first release here in the, in the Eastern Cape. And this is the Kabusi River near Stutterheim, where it's predicted not to produce a single generation over winter. Um, this was me making the first release. Kaylee, this is when you were in Matami. And uh, there the little insects are. We released them out of um, polystyrene containers, and there they are heading off into South Africa, into the great unknown. And that's what the site looks like in winter. And what, what did we expect? So Ben Miller, who's sitting in the audience, did his work looking at how this population of Megamelis goes over, over winter um, at Kabusi, at that exact site. And what he found was that the water hyacinth stays pretty low, it warms up, the biomass increases and water hyacinth does really well in that summertime, but look how long it takes for megamelis to catch up. So now this is megamelis released in 2013. It's hung around, but every winter it dies. And then it only reaches a peak at the end of summer. And then we, we back to square one. So, we now have these high felt systems that are invaded by water hyacinth. They're so um, that they they nutrient rich, and we've we try the, tried to implement bio, biocontrol, but we know that we're not going to be very successful. And one of these systems is Hardebeer's Port Dam, and I bet you didn't know that it's South Africa's second biggest tourist hotspot after the Cape Town um, BNA waterfront. Yeah. <laughs> It's been hypertrophic since the 1970s. Um, water hyacinth was chemically controlled in the 1980s, but the eutrophication was never addressed. So there was no attempt made to limit the amount of nutrients coming in from Johannesburg and Pretoria. A remediation program was started where they tried to um, suck up the nutrients from the dam, but this didn't actually address what was coming into the dam. 20 by 2015, millions of rands had been spent, and in 2017, Department of Water and Sanitation said no more money, and they left it, um, and the dam was then overrun with water hyacinth. We were always asked, why are you not doing biocontrol on Hardebeer's Port Dam? And we said, absolutely not. It will give biocontrol a bad name. We know that these insects will never establish because it's too cold, and if they do establish, they're not going to do anything to the plants because the the water's too nutrient rich. And we said that we're staying out of it. And by, at this point in 2018, we were mandated by um, environmental affairs, by working, the, they said, you, you need to do something, you've got to get involved. And so we went across to have a look at, at what was going on. And all the available agents that had been released in the 90s were present on these plants. 
can't see the date, but it was sometime in March 2018. We went across to um, a meeting. I think it was mm, and Grant. Yeah, the three of us went to this meeting and we were very skeptical about fire control. They put them. Um, they said no more spraying. They weren't going to spray the water hyacinth. And we said you guys are being really silly because there's no other way to control it. And we went down to the site, which was one of the estates um, on the dam. And oh, just to acknowledge Dave Kinsler's amazing macrophyte monitoring tool, which is a Google engine tool that he's developed for us, which gives us these incredible satellite images. And we had a look at the plants and they were riddled with insect damage. But even though they were riddled with damage, these primary producers were still outcompete, or they weren't being damaged at all. There's a timer on this. Weren't being outcompeted at all, uh, or weren't being um, damaged at all by the herbivores because of the abundant resources. And this is because we, we were relying on what we call classical biological control. And that's the process of throwing out some insects and saying, good luck out there. We hope you do well. So in 2019, we thought, well, let's, let's try something different. Let's work with megamelis. We know it can, uh, we can rear it quite easily under quarantine conditions. It grows very quickly. Let's, let's have a different approach. And this was based on work that Martin had done in, um, in Africa, Lake Malawi and Lake Victoria, where the local communities got involved in mass rearing control agents. And it was a very simple technology. These are just blue seagull swimming pools, water hyacinth in them. And at this point, it was just the Neocatina weevils. Now, bearing in mind, this was in the tropical um, equatorial region of Africa. So it was very easy to get vast numbers of agents quickly. And this is the Kasumu um, Yacht Club in Kenya in 1998. And following this mass rearing program, that's what the system looked like. So restored to some kind of usefulness to both people and the aquatic ecosystem. And we actually wrote a paper about it and then didn't really do much about it in South Africa. Then we decided let's take what we know about mass rearing and do what we can with megamelis. And so up at the um, Vineck mass rearing facility, which is up on the hill as you're coming into Grahamstown on the end too, if you see those tunnels and at night they glow red and blue, and the only weed we're growing is water hyacinth and weeds. Um, we, rear, we, we, we rear biocontrol agents. And these, it's Majeke and Landile, are part of our Sisonke program, which is our program of people working with disabilities. And they were responsible for collecting megamelis using little handheld vacuum cleaners, which we would then pop into a little curry container and courier off to Harder Beer Sport. And every two weeks throughout 2019, we sent between six and 10,000 megamelis to our PhD student, Kanilwe Sebola, um, and she would release them around the dam every two weeks throughout 2019. We also, um, with Kim and Ben and um, others, we set up a mass rearing facility at Pekinwood College. So this was one of these school mass rearing facilities where we could get the school children to also get involved and, and, and take responsibility for the system that they lived on. And here's a picture of some of these, these guys releasing plants covered in megamelis into the system. And so for the whole of 2019, we must have released nearly half a million um, megamelis. But September 2019, this is after a very intensive effort, we're looking at 35% cover of water hyacinth on the system. But in December, suddenly this started to go down and Ben went, Ben Miller went to, to check it out. He and Martin went to check it out. And Ben said he's never seen so many megamelis in his life. But the, oh, why is this timer on? Oh, well. Okay. And in January, we went to, um, I was running, I was doing a project, a WRC project with um, a whole lot of collaborators from, from Europe. And this, project just happened to coincide with this, where everyone was phoning us and saying that water hyacinth has been sprayed. Somebody sprayed it with, with herbicide and um, 
the plants are all brown. And there was a moratorium, well, there, there is a moratorium on spraying. So we knew that this couldn't be the case. And we went, this is at the bridge. So this is, um, flows down into the Crocodile River. All the brown is water hyacinth. All the green is other plants growing on top of the water hyacinth. So if it had been sprayed, everything would be brown. And when we had a look at the plants, every single leaf was teeming with megamelis. They were also teeming with the weevils. So we hadn't even released the weevils, but in the absence of that herbicide, that constant herbicide spraying, these weevil populations had built up as well. And by the end of January, there was about 5% water hyacinth left on Heart of Port Dam. And in the middle of July, middle of COVID, we were looking at 1.7%. And we patted ourselves on the back and said, we've done a fantastic job. And then in October, when we had a look both at the satellite images and on the ground, beautiful green patches of water hyacinth. And that's because water hyacinth has this really huge seed bank and each flower can produce thousands of seeds and these seeds remain viable for, well, the reports say up to 25 years. And a study that we did in um, 2010 showed that we were finding approximately two and a half thousand seeds per meter squared. And this is a micrograph of seeds that I think Emil found. Um, Emil sitting at the back there, we went through part of Port sediment, which is not a very nice thing to go through, and found these seeds. And we were getting, again, very high numbers, 800 seeds um, per meter squared. And this is what these little seedlings look like. So summer came, the nutrients were there, the heat was there, and the seedlings germinated. And by December, we were looking at 42% of water hyacinth again. And everyone was saying, oh, you're back well, didn't work, and what are you going to do about it? We carried on releasing. So we carried on mass rearing. We carried on releasing. We set up another rearing facility. Well, we actually set up a couple more rearing facilities. This is at a housing estate called the Cobes with very expensive, very fancy houses. And in the background there, you can see the, the tunnels. And from there, we kept on releasing insects. And the bugs exploded too. And that's very, a very happy biocontroller pulling out plants. And I was just littered with, with megamelis. By February, that mat had gone down to 17%. And when we went to investigate um, what was going on, again, brown plants and the insects were, they were, escaping. They, they were saying there's absolutely no chance of any nutrition in these plants. So that top-down, sorry, that top-down exertion had really ruined their resources. And because they couldn't get anything out of these plants, they abandoned the plants in search of more water hyacinth. And we were getting calls from residents. This is a swarm of megamelis. This is a tennis court at the coves, and this is about 500 meters, a kilometer away from, from the actual dam. So Mega Melis was leaving the plants as well in search of healthy water hyacinth. And in the morning, that is what was left. And you can imagine people in their multi-million rand houses, their stoops are covered in insects, their mouths are covered in insects, they can't eat at the at the restaurants because there's just mega melis in their food. So we had to really um, go on, a, on an active um, community engagement or, or social media campaign saying, don't worry, it's not gonna last very long. And it didn't last very long. By March, we were looking at 7%. This is that same site, the coves, end of March, those plants were very brown. And by May, 2021, there wasn't a plant left. Um, at that site. But if you have a look at the water, it's still rather green. So we had got rid of the plants, but we haven't addressed the nutrients. And just to show you over time, so that was the peak in 2019. The lowest point in January. And if we just zoom in um, on this section, here you can see that 
as the plants increase from October from seedlings through our inundated releases, we managed to get up to between six and 10,000 megamelis per meter squared. But as you can see, there's still this winter gap. So what we really, what we realized we really have to focus on now is getting insects into that system as soon as they start germinating again. And the only way that we can do that is through this augmented biological control program. So what we've done is we've increased our herbivore pool, we've reduced our primary producer pool, but we need to still deal with these abundant resources. Throughout this uh, campaign, we've realized that information is key. Everybody's an expert, everybody knows what's going on um, and everyone has an opinion. And so our Facebook page has very high reaches with constant um, updates on, on what was going on. We got this information out into the local newspaper, the Cormorant, some very fine reporting there. Part of Beersport community joins effort to rear biocontrol agents. We then ended up on TV, SABC, ENCA, 702, SAFM. Rosalie Smith, my postdoc, was on Radio Sonofrensa two nights ago. Um, and so this, this story has really gone national. The Mail and Guardian report made, um, produced a really nice piece of work not so long ago. Good Things Guy, if anybody follows him, he reports good, um, good news stories. And it even went as far as the Times London. Just last week, the Financial Mail reported um, an article on the bug that saved hearties. And this was all about property prices. And they said that in 2017, you could get a 12 million rand house at Pekinwood for 4 million rand. And this was coming from property um, from estate agents to now selling prices in Hotter Beer Sport have surged nearly 40% over the past three years. And the estate agents attribute this to the biological control. So although water hyacinth is limited, or biocontrol is limited, we know, by nutrient pollution, by cold winters, interference from herbicides and these huge seed banks, if we can embark on an inundative mass rearing campaign, we can get control. But what was key to this program is stakeholder involvement at every step of the way. I don't know where this timer came from. And so now we want to take this technology to the rest of the world. We need to get this into all those other systems in Africa, in Southeast Asia, where water hyacinth is, is a huge plague and using this inundative community-based mass rearing um, to do so. And I'd just like to thank you all for listening to these musings. I'm sorry about some of these, these technical um, issues. I'd like to thank all of my colleagues from the CBC, colleagues in the zoo department and the botany department, um, my students, past students, present students, um, and of course my family and all of my friends. Thank you very much. I couldn't have got to where I am without you. And especially Martin, this one was for you.
Hello, hello. <laughs> 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 